So hi and welcome back to JST. Today I am switching to a new topic that is shamanism and in particular shamanism in Japan. This is kind of my core topic and it's something I dedicated my entire PhD so that's to say something like the last five or four years of my life so it's something I hold very dear and that I enjoy very much. So I will try to give you some quick information about shamanism. What is shamanism actually in anthropological speaking and in, in the religious studies? And then what is shamanism in Japan and how it developed throughout the centuries and throughout history? This is going to be a very long video so it's possible that I won't uh, discuss everything this time and I will, I will keep something for, for other videos. So first of all, anthropologically speaking, shamanism is a very complex topic. It's been studied and debated and studied again, used and uh, misused for the last, uh, I think, a hundred years. And uh, it's something that uh, usually give birth to a huge debate and sometimes to a huge, how to say, huge controversies within the field. So the first to study shamanism and shamanic practices were missionaries and explorers that went to Russia. So it's roughly speaking a study that uh, began in a very particular context and in the term very specific to describe a peculiar, a peculiar role within Russian Siberian uh, societies. So uh, the, the word itself is shaman is an uh, English translation of, of a very peculiar term which is a saman which is I think if I remember correctly a Yakut term which is used to, to refer to this particular man or woman sometimes that holds a special place within a, a given community and it has been used widely to describe this kind of men all over Russia and uh, sometimes these terms was also implied in other cultural um, area. So in the beginning the shaman has been considered the one that is in possess of peculiar techniques to reach ecstasy. So the shaman is a man or a woman who is capable to reach altered state of mind via different uh, means. It might be trance or ecstasy. Shaman uh, is able to attain a different state of mind and with that particular state of mind he is capable to communicate with the gods and the dead. So the shaman has always been considered as someone that is able to cross the borders between worlds. From this first description of the shamanism and the shaman himself, a lot of different studies took place and, as I was saying before, all over the world. So we begin to talk about shamanism not only in Siberia but also, for example, in Southeast Asia, in Mongolia, in China and in Japan too. Of course, the theoretical analysis of the, uh, of the phenomenon also changed through times and uh, different studies brought a different conclusion about what shamanism actually is. Today the question is still very um, open, in the sense that today a lot of researchers consider the fact that trance and ecstasy themselves are not the main element to consider someone as shaman, but the most important thing is to consider the role that this uh, man or woman has in a society. So today we can say, I guess, widely, but still with some problem, that the shaman is the man or the woman who is actually the mediator between different worlds. So it's not a simple member of the clergy, or it's not a simple monk, or a simple priest. It's actually someone that is able to be a passage of communications between two dimensions. If we think about Japan, a lot of research for a long time considered uh, local spiritual practitioners not to be considered shamans, so they were uh, more likely to be called medium or uh, simply uh, ascetic practitioners. And for some reason a lot of women and shaman-like apprentices didn't get the title of shaman for a long time, mainly because the practice there differs from that of other area, in particular from the Siberia one. So if the original shaman is considered to be the, the Siberian model, it's very hard to to include in this description the Japanese uh, reality. One researcher in particular decided that Japanese phenomenon and Itako in particular were not to be considered shamans. And this was Mircea Eliad, which is one of the most renowned researcher and historian in the 
history of religions and religious studies and anthropology of religions. He wrote a huge essay about shamanism and he's the one that actually defined shaman as someone that acquired an altered state of mind. And while doing so, uh, he also describes different way in which shamans become such. So there are, there are thousands of pages written about this and he's very rigid in his definition because he has in mind Siberian style. So when he comes to analyze Japanese religion and Japanese realities, he states clearly that Itako and the like are not shaman because they don't follow those specific rules and those, those specific patterns. Still today there is a lot of debate about this and still today um, it's very hard to prove without any doubt that Itako or other specialists in Japan are actually shamans. However, in time this very rigid definition by Eliot was slowly abandoned and in order to improve also the ethnographic elements of the work, which Eliot didn't have because he was an historian so he actually never went on the field in some area, in order to improve those aspects of the research, other uh, the descriptions and other uh, definition were proposed. And one of the most interesting one is the one that I mentioned before. So the idea that trance or ecstasy are not so vital to describe someone as a shaman. So in more recent years, uh, researcher and anthropologists offered new definition of shamans and they suggest not to focus so much on the uh, trance and ecstasy element, but on the role, the social, the communal dimension of the shaman. I particularly like this idea because I think it's uh, very important to consider what the shaman is considered in a given society. So, for example, almost everywhere those men or women that are considered shaman-like figures are those that are mediator between worlds. So this is the role that today shaman is considered to fulfill. And I think that with this definition in mind, we can also say that Itako and other religious specialists in Japan may be widely considered within the shaman practice. Of course, the topic is bigger and wider and much debated and there are lots of fights in this, in this definition and not everyone agrees. But I think that the, the notion of the shaman as a mediator, so someone uh, that works between worlds, is something that is very fitting and it, it gives a very almost visual idea of what a shaman is. So the shaman is a mediator between different worlds, between the world of the human and the world of the spirits. And from here uh, we can start and see how to become a shaman and what are the main tasks that shamans do, actually. Um, traditionally speaking, there are different reasons to become a shaman. One of these is uh, often when you read the descriptions of shamans all over the world, you will see that some specific person shows some strange symptoms and starts to have dreams and uh, they start to experience a spiritual calling towards the profession. This is the case, for example, of different kamisama in Japan, which describe their profession as a call from a god, from a specific god, which began to appear in the dreams and to appear during daytime and to show the path to follow. A second reason to become a shaman is the so-called hereditary transmission. This means that sometimes in different parts of the world, the shaman appears to be part of a family that has always been shaman. So for example, a shaman will become such in order to follow in her father or mother's footsteps. You don't find a lot of these examples in Japan, but if I remember correctly, somehow um, in Okinawa you may find some of this kind of shamanism and some of the Itako I met actually will fit the profile because they are Itako because their own mother was Itako and so they feel like fulfilling the same role. A third, a third type of shamanism that we can find is the, how to say, the choice, the voluntary choice. And this is one of the most debated even today. Itako are exactly in, in this kind of path. So Itako usually are or have been for a long time blind young girls that had to choose this profession in order to find a way of living and uh, not be a burden for the families and the community. So it was a very practical choice and it didn't imply any previous knowledge of the field, any call from the gods. So the choice is a very controversial element because, how to say, it's often considered fake shamanism. In any case,
case, when the men or the women start the profession, they always undergo a very intense period of training and also ascetic practice. So depending on the region, on the culture, on the age of the apprentice, uh, this time will, will change a lot. Again, depending on the society and on the culture of the specific shamans, this training will change. Uh, in time and intensity and in the actual way in which it develops. However, there may be some elements that return every time. One of these is, for example, the fact that the shaman has to undergo an initia initiation rite. Uh, that is to say, a specific ritual in which he finishes the training and actually becomes a complete shaman. Often in this rituals there are some very similar symbols like that of death and new life or that of the wedding, the womb and the newborn baby. Once the shaman completes the training and undergoes the uh, initiation ritual then he can start with his everyday life and everyday new practice. And the practice always entail a communication with the world of the spirits. The shamans either talks with the gods and the celestial spirits or with the dead. And in both cases, the shaman makes rituals to improve the wealth and the well-being of the community in which he lives. So again, depending on the specific culture in which and the specific community in which the shaman works, this ritual will be held in order to improve the agriculture or to help cattle and the other animals. So if we talk about more um, pastoral uh, like community, there is always the need for a better uh, communication between the world of the gods and the world of the living. And again, for the dead, often the shaman is considered to be like the, the mediator with the world of the dead and the kind of a ferryman for the soul of the newly dead, which has to enter the other world. So again, if we consider the shaman as someone that fulfills these specific roles of communication between two dimensions, in Japan we can see a lot of this kind of practitioners and itako are no exception because they too are women usually uh, blind women that enter the profession because of a very important practical need and yet they manage to learn different skills, a lot of rituals and chants and songs in order to help the community in the communication with the gods and with the dead. I think this video needs to end because I put inside a lot of information and maybe they weren't that clear and I was not so clear in explaining them so I think it's time I, it's time I stop. But I hope you were interested in this and as always thumbs up and if you haven't subscribed yet subscribe please and again uh, I hope I can talk about shamanism a little more and specifically in Japan and uh, well I'll talk to you soon bye